and his name shall be called Mighty God. When I think of mighty people or heroes in, in our day's world, I think of some movies over the last several years that have been really popular. I think of a superhero like Superman who comes in and has the powers of a god, super strength, the ability to fly, and, and is able to fix all of the massive problems in life. Stop nuclear bombs, go back in time, amazing things. And I think of people like Thor, the Norse god who was the greatest of all the gods in Norse mythology, with his hammer coming in and defeating hordes of aliens. And I wanna put my hope in this, but the problem is, they're not real. And even as gods, they're not that big of a deal. Because in real life, the gods are weaker even still. King Sennacherib of Assyria knew this, and he boasted about it when he went out to conquer. This is what he said. He said, has any one of the gods of the nations ever delivered his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? He asked the people of Jerusalem. Well, none for none of these gods were as mighty as this mortal king. But King Sennacherib was surprised by the God of Jerusalem, who did indeed deliver his people from the conqueror's hand. The psalmist describes the Lord as king of glory, the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle, for his power extends beyond the land and the house of Israel, but to all creation, to all his creation, the work of his hands. He has the power to deliver from the enemy because it was by his power and his will that all things were created and have their being. It is only under his authority and by his permission that any ruler is allowed to rule. Thus the Psalms reminds us, if rulers conspire together against the Lord and his anointed, they do so in vain, for he is enthroned in heaven and shall break or rule them with a rod of iron. And actually, Psalm 2 says it is the Lord's anointed. The Hebrew word is Messiah, who will break them. We forget that today sometimes. Putin has invaded the Ukraine, and we have disasters and conflicts fermenting throughout the world. And if a greater war should break out, this time, we have such weapons and such populations that we could kill more people today than even were alive at the end of the last world war. What God of what land can deliver us from that? The Messiah can. The Lord's anointed who came once to save and who will come again to rule as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Jesus to whom all authority has been given. Not baby Jesus or cartoon Jesus or bumper sticker Jesus, but the anointed Jesus who conquered death itself. Jesus through whom and for whom all things were created. Jesus, our mighty God. Hello, I'm really glad you joined us online today. Whenever you're joining us, it's always a good time to hear from God himself. We're in the second week of our series titled, His Name Shall Be Called, and we're turning our focus during this Christmas season to the promise and hope that God gave us when his son was born into our world to draw close to us and to help us, to strengthen us with his might that like no one else can. Today we're going to see that there is power in Jesus' name. In just a few weeks, we'll celebrate and remember the birth of Jesus Christ, the Savior and hope of the world. But in our world right now, with all that's pressing in on us, we need a reminder that there is hope to be found in God himself. We need a reminder that God sees our situation and he has promised to meet our deepest needs in the situation that we're in if we'll just call on him and ask him for his help. So in this season, we celebrate God's gift of Jesus Christ. Jesus is God in the flesh miraculously conceived to a virgin named Mary 
Jesus was raised by Mary and Joseph, devout Jewish family, who followed God's laws carefully. He began his public ministry at age 30. He called followers who would eventually carry on his movement and keep it going. And it's, it's grown tremendously. But he did all of this by living only 33 years. He never sinned. He lived a perfect life. And then he gave himself for us through a cruel death on the cross. But three days later, he was raised again, displaying his power over death and displaying his might. He is the mighty God. So weekly, the church, Christ followers everywhere, gather to celebrate his resurrection on Sunday morning because he rose on the first day of the week. And Sunday is the first day of the week in our calendar. The timing, frequency, and rhythm of this weekly gathering is no accident. It's, it's really helpful. If you're like me, I need Sundays to come along so I can hear the truth of God's word and sing praises with God's people to honor what God is doing and has done in our lives. I need to look around and know that I'm not alone in my beliefs and I'm strengthened in the faith as I look at what God's word says because by Sundays, often I'm running on empty. My spiritual and even physical energy may be waning. My perspective needs readjusting. My concern level could be rising with the challenges or the news that has ramped up my fears. And I need a, a fresh start. And that's why it's so great that we have Sunday mornings to gather because we need God's word. We need his perspective. The songs we sing on Sunday mornings remind us of the truth of God's word. And we need this because everywhere we turn, we see looming threats. A fresh reminder uh, uh, from God's word is just what we need. That's true for us, and that was certainly true for God's people in the past. In the Bible, God used prophets to bring a word of hope at just the right time, right when fear was gripping the hearts of his people and leaders. The verses and chapters uh, that we base this Christmas series on are coming from a time in history uh, when God's people were barely hanging on. They were hanging on by a thread. The threat of invasion uh, for God's people in the land of Judah in the 8th century was real and imminent. Judah was feeling pressure from all sides. And let's look at a map that helps us set the stage for understanding their situation. Uh, they, they were in civil war with the nation directly above them and a country from the northeast, Syria. The prophecies of Isaiah are set against the backdrop of a rising Assyrian empire. This resurgent ancient Nathan nation posed a very real threat to the land of Judah and the, the nation of Israel as well. Israel and Judah had been one nation, but they split into two 
and they were in a civil war, which means that God's people were divided. They were divided into two. Israel and Assyria teamed up against Judah, which was a smaller nation. Ahaz, Judah's king, was shaking in fear, and the people were shaking in fear. It, it, it doesn't look good for Judah and their king, Ahaz. Isaiah 7, 1 is where we're going to start today. This took place during the reign of Ahaz, the nation of Judah's king, son of Jotham, son of Uzziah, king of Judah. Aram's king risen. Aram was within Assyria. And Israel's king Pekah, son of Ramaya, northern kingdom's king, uh, went, they went to fight against Jerusalem, but they were not able to conquer it. Imagine two forces aligning against you. I mean, two forces that would outnumber you greatly. They pretty much camp on your northern border and imagine the fear that would be in the king and the people of the land of Judah. Isaiah 7, 2 says, When it became known to the house of David, a reference to Judah, that Aram had occupied Ephraim, the heart of Ahaz, the king, and the hearts of his people trembled like trees of the forest, shaking in the wind. Here's a picture of trees in, on an island in New Zealand that were permanently bent because of their area's strong winds. Fear can grip us like this. It can really shake us to the core, so much so that we lose our appetite we might really slip into a dark hole. It may not take us out, but fear threatens to double us over and damage our ability to press forward. This was taking a, toll, a toll on the people of Judah. They were trembling in fear. The hearts of his people were trembling like trees of a forest shaking in the wind. The Lord was speaking through Isaiah, one of God's prophets, <clears throat> and prophets were God's spokesmen. Here is a quick role, uh, definition of the role of a prophet, and Thad talked about this last week, so I'm just going to mention it here. God spoke through the prophets in the Old Testament. The prophets exposed sinful practices, called people back to God's ways, warned people of the coming judgment, and anticipated the coming of the Messiah. So let's go back to the passage. Isaiah 7, 3, and 4. The Lord said to Isaiah, Go out with your son, Shir Jezab, to meet Ahaz at the end of the conduit of the upper pool by the road to the launderer's field, say to him, calm down and be quiet. Don't be afraid or cowardly because of these two smoldering sticks, the fierce anger of Razan and Aram, the son of Ramayah. Isaiah brings a word of courage to this fearful king. The king's heart is shaking in fear. And it's almost like Isaiah grips him by the shoulders and says, Settle down. Calm yourself. God will strengthen us if we face our fears if we turn to him when we're facing fear. 
He can help us face down our fears. Let's continue in the passage. Isaiah 7, 5 through 9. For Aram, along with Ephraim and the son of Ramiah, has plotted a harm against you. They say, let's go up against Judah, terrorize it, and conquer it for ourselves. Then we can install Tebal's son as king in it. These, these were their specific threats. This is what the Lord God says. It will not happen. It will not occur. Isaiah tells them, God won't allow it. And to be legitimate, a prophet needed to be 100% accurate. And so in two years, these kings would not be in power. That's what happened. The chief city of Aram is Damascus. The chief of Damascus is Rezin. Uh, within 65 years, Ephraim will be too shattered to be a people. The chief city of Ephraim is Samaria, and the chief of Samaria is the son of Ramaya. If you do not stand firm in, the, in your faith, then you will not stand at all. Isaiah tells the king to get a grip on his faith, to take refuge in God himself, to turn to him and seek him. In the next chapter, Isaiah has another message to deliver, but this time it's regarding the threat of invasion from the Assyrians from the northeast. Everywhere people were turning, there were whispers and conspiracy theories. And again, it was crippling people because of their fear. They were, God's people, who should take refuge in him, were crippled in fear. So let's look at the next chapter, Isaiah 8, 12 and 13. Do not call everything a conspiracy that these people say is a conspiracy. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be terrified. You are to regard only the Lord of armies as holy. Only he should be feared. Only he should be held in awe. This is the message Isaiah gives. Do not be overcome with fear. God is the strong Lord of the armies. He is holy, and he's the only one that you should fear. Let's fast forward to today, the year 2022. Everywhere we turn, we see looming threats. We have a divided country, the worst inflation. We're experiencing the worst inflation in 40 years. And we have an international conflict going on that is deeply concerning when it comes to nuclear capabilities. That's not to mention our own personal lives, the things we're dealing with, the struggles with finances or the uh, struggles with relationships. Some of us are facing challenges and we, we don't know who to talk to. Maybe we don't think anyone would understand what we're going through. And all of these threats combined may have you trembling and battling fear. In the context of the nation of Israel 2,700 years ago and our context today in 2022, we're given a promise in the book of Isaiah. And this promise is wrapped up in the name of a child whose name is the solution to the chaos we're facing. And there is power in the name of Jesus. In the face of looming threats, you can be sure 
that personal strength is available when we ask God for help to deal with our fears. Here's our theme passage for the series, Isaiah 9, 6. For to us, a child is born, to us, a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And in a name's highest use, it sums up the character of the person who carries that name. It declares who the person is at the core of their being. We name children after people we admire, personal friends and parents. We admire people in our family or friends whom we have a long history with and they're dear to us, so we name our children after them. We name our children after famous people we admire in hopes that our kids will accomplish some of the same, same things they did or have the character they had. Both of my names, it's interesting, mean loyal. Randall means shield wolf, and Scott Randall Scott means uh, from Scotland, loyal. It, it implies loyalty. I'm not from Scotland. My name is from the island of Wales. But anyway, loyalty is wrapped up in my name. Jesus' name reveals his character, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. The character of this child is wrapped up in the name God given, gave him, the names God gave him through the prophet Isaiah. He is the Mighty God who is able to help us and counsel us in our fears. He is the mighty God who, help, who will help us deal with our fears if we turn to him. He is God who is greater than our fear, including seemingly impossible circumstances. We rely on our mighty God and we don't rely on other powerful people. Isaiah 8.13, But the Lord of hosts, him you shall honor as holy. Let him be your fear. Let him be your dread. We should fear no one or no thing but God alone. To fear God means to take him seriously and live within his boundaries for life. And we aim to do, it means that we aim to do what pleases God. We trust him to help us and no one else. Psalm 146, 3 and 4 says, Put not your trust in princes, in a son of a man, in a son of man, in whom there is no salvation, when his breath departs, he returns to the earth. On that very day, his plans perish. Putting our trust in princes and kings is not wise because when they die, their plans, maybe their good plans, perish with, with them. Sometimes I've carried powerful people around in the back pocket of my mind and I've done this in a real unrealistic way. I, I may know them personally or may have a connection to them somehow. And I, I don't even know if they'd be willing to help or able to help when I needed it. But I trusted them in an unrealistic way nonetheless. This is not wise when... 
I have access, when you and I have access to the mighty God who is willing to help us in our troubles. He, we can call on him. He often provides help through his church, the relationships that we have. And here's the truth. Psalm 46, 1 and 2. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear the through the though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea. God wants to help us when we're in trouble. And he will help if we call on him. Also, we don't seek other sources of wisdom besides God and his people. This is what the nation of, the people of the nation of of Judah were doing. Thad looked at this last week, so I'll move through this quickly. Isaiah 8, 19, when they say to you, inquire of the mediums and the necromancers who chirp and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Should not, should they inquire of the dead on behalf of the living? The people of Judah were consulting mediums and people who talked to the dead, necromancers, and this was forbidden in their law. It's also forbidden. Today, we might go to for, fortune tellers or depend on astrology for guidance. That's specifically for forbidden in God's law as well. We do this even though God has promised to pour out his wisdom on us if we ask. James 1.5, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives to generously to all without reproach and it will be given him. We can be shaken by fear, but that's when we need to exercise faith, regardless of how we feel. We have the mighty God to help us. When in fear, you need to declare, you and I both need to declare, I will stand firm in the faith. Often, we don't feel faith when we need to exercise faith and King Ahaz was told, if you are not firm in the faith, you will not be firm at all. At all. We, we don't have to feel faith to live by faith. In fact, most of the time when we need faith, we don't feel it. We, we don't feel like trusting God when we're in pain physically or hurting emotionally, but that's what makes faith faith. It's trusting God to come through for you, whether you feel like it or not. And when you're shaking like trees in the forest, it's trusting God to choose faith and trust him that he will come through for you. God wants to be the strength of your heart when your heart is caving in and shaking in fear. Here's a passage that I go to often. Psalm 73, 25, 26, and 28. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. But for me, It is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all your works. We turn to God and we pour out our heart to him and he strengthens us. When our flesh is weak, when our heart is failing, he promises to give strength and that's what he's done in my experience. We cast our burdens on him, and he will be our strength and refuge. I draw my strength from the Lord. Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore, the Lord himself 
will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. Jesus has come to earth. He has drawn close to us to be our wonderful counselor and mighty God. He strengthens us. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. Jesus, the mighty God, is with us. So we need to turn to him when we're in fear, shaking in fear, and he will help us with our troubles. The truth is that God is just waiting for us to turn to him and trust him with our troubles. What's going on in the world could be causing you to fear the future. (laughs) I think a lot of us are fearing the future right now. Jesus was born not only to bring salvation in eternity, but to help us right here in in the here and now. He wants to help, and he wants to strengthen our hearts when our hearts are failing. And if we call on him, he will do just that. If we learn to seek the strength of God that he gives through his word and through his prophets and through his apostles, then we will grow in him. We will grow our faith and be stronger. I want to stop and give you some time to think through some next steps to take after hearing this message. Uh, I have some suggestions. You may have others that have come to mind as we've walked through this message. But here are the steps. For the first time, I will accept Jesus as my Savior and follow him as Lord. Another step, I will stand firm as I deal with this specific fear. Fill in the blank in your mind. You, you may have something that you, some fear that you've been struggling with and you can't get a grip. And so turn to God, ask God for help with that specific fear. And then the third step you could take is I will draw my strength from God alone, not powerful people whom I think could do something for me. But I trust God alone. And I turn to him for help and refuge when I need the help. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you so much for your kindness and goodness to us. I praise you, God, for the the help with our fears. And you, you are in charge of history. And you are bringing history to a glorious end. It, it, we can't see it here and now, but we can trust you to be doing just that, to be bringing history to an end that lines up with your purposes for good for those who love you. And I pray that, God, you would give us the strength to trust you and uh, exercise faith when we don't feel it and that you would help us to take the steps that you've laid on our hearts to take. I pray this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.